several years ago when uh, George W. was president, I had the opportunity to meet him, shake his hand, and, and have a really brief conversation with him. <clears throat> and it was kind of a, uh, a big deal. You know, it was like, wow, meeting the president of the United States. How many of you have ever met uh, the president, any president? Anybody you ever met the president, shook his hand? Yeah? Well, good. Not very many of us. But, uh, you know, we live, we're a little far removed from uh, that circle. And, but it's just kind of a big deal when we meet someone like that. Or a famous actor or actress or somebody that's kind of a, you know, big shot in our culture, maybe an athlete. It's kind of a, you know, cool thing. I remember when I, when I met Rick Warren for the first time. And, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, Rick Warren is, uh, you know, kind of a big deal in the church world. <clears throat> and that was kind of cool. But... Um, my dad, when I was a kid, introduced me to a, little, uh, a guy who was uh, kind of the, one of the winningest coaches in, uh, in West Virginia. My dad was a basketball coach, you know, in my school, and we always came to the state championships, the tournaments up here in March, and he introduced me to a guy named Jennings Boyd. How many of you know that name, Jennings Boyd? Yeah, he coached at a school down in McDowell County called North Fork, and I think seven years in a row they won the state championship. That's kind of like a legacy uh, in, I believe, double A, uh, mostly double A schools. And my dad introduced me to him, and I thought, well, this is kind of a big deal. I was a little kid, and, and he was kind of a giant in, uh, in the basketball world, and that's what my life consisted of, a lot of it, when I was younger. <clears throat> but I remember standing near him uh, sometime later and hearing him uh, you know, say some things that I thought, wow, why, you know, why did he say that? Why does he talk like that? And... Um, I remember thinking, you know what? He's just an ordinary guy. He's just an ordinary guy. And even uh, presidents, uh, you know, I believe, put their pants on the same way most of us guys do, don't they? I think, unless maybe they have someone helping them do that. I know in ancient times, kings would, uh, you know, kings might have people helping them put their pants on. But, gosh, if you need help putting your pants on, maybe you're in a nursing home or something. But, uh, and that's okay. But... Uh, uh, you know, people are mostly just people, aren't they, in this life? Whether you have a high status or, or you're, uh, you know, you're some title in front of your name, you're just an ordinary guy or, or woman. And when we all, we strip away the titles and all the, the wealth or the, you know, the stuff of our life, we're all equal, aren't we? <clears throat> we're all equal. We're just the same. And, uh, and so don't be, don't be overwhelmed by somebody of a high status and get all nervous about, you know, who they are. And, you know, certainly show a lot of respect and dignity, but, uh, you know, they're just people. But today, you know, we're going to talk about the, the man who was no ordinary man. And, uh, you know, we've been, we've been pointing toward him for some time now in this series, the story. And uh, this series is taking us through the Bible chronologically. That's why if you have a storybook, it's a chronological journey through the Bible. The Bible itself is not compiled chronologically. It's more by genre of literature, you know, all the prophets together, the poetry together, the history together, uh, and things like that. But uh, the, the story series taking us through the Bible, and I've told you this from the beginning when we started last spring, is that this entire series is pointing to this one man. <clears throat> this, he's not even extraordinary. He's more than that. He's more than extraordinary. And it's all pointing to him. And the two weeks ago, Steve Harley, while I was in Haiti, he, uh, he introduced us to the birth of Christ. You know, it was like Christmas in uh, September. And then last week, uh, Ryan talked about John the Baptizer and, and all that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the surrounding uh, uh, Jesus and his early ministry. And they did great jobs. And, and today, you know, we're going to talk about him again today and next week and one more week after that. So the story is all about him. Okay, don't miss that. And someone, if someone were to ask you, hey, what's the Bible about? One word will answer them. You don't have to know any of the details. You just say, what's the Sunday school answer? Jesus. What's the story about? Jesus. Hey, what did the preacher preach about today? Jesus. And you'll get it right. Because I want to tell you, any preacher that preaches, it doesn't at least end with Jesus. He's not really preaching. Because it all starts and ends with Jesus. It really does. It's about Jesus. So uh, <clears throat> he was no ordinary man. 
We're going to talk about him. You know, they understood, the Old Testament people, that there was no God like their God. They said, among the gods, there's none like you. I like that second song we sang this morning. You know, you turn water to wine, there's no one like you. And there really wasn't. He was different. No one can compare to him. And maybe you're here today and you're, uh, maybe you're a skeptic. Or maybe you're not a believer. You're not a Christian. You, you kind of come with people or you just come because, eh, you know, it's not a bad thing to do. But you've not really put in both feet. You've not really accepted or trusted Christ for your salvation and begun living that lifestyle. Maybe you're kind of there on the fence and you think, hey, it's okay if my wife goes to church, but it's just for sissies and weak men, and I'm just going to, you know, I'm too tough for that. Or, or maybe you're a woman here today, and you're like, you know, I've been searching for a lot of things. I don't know if this is right or not. Listen, I can't make you fall in love with Jesus. I can't, I can't somehow get into your brain and flip a switch and make you a believer or make you someone who wants to trust Christ. But as Andy Stanley says, I can help set up the first date. And so my job as the preacher is to is to kind of introduce him in a way that you say, hey, I want to know more about him. I want to know more. Tell me more. What do I need to do? And so <clears throat> let's talk about him. Now, again, a lot of skeptics may say, hey, you know, you say he was perfect. He never sinned. Uh, he was all God. No wonder he didn't sin. I mean, if I had all God in me, I wouldn't sin either. But, you know, we say that he was all God, but he was also what? All man, all human. There's stories about him when he was a little boy, and these are what we call apocryphal, or they're not in the Bible, but you can read them in other books. When he was a little boy, maybe eight years old, uh, that, that he and some other friends were, were making mud pies, and they were playing in the mud. And the story goes, again, it's an old, old story, but it's not in the Bible. But it, it goes that he, he made mud pies, and then he kind of got bored with that, and he made doves, and he turned them into real doves, into life, and they flew away. <clears throat> now, wouldn't that be cool as an eight-year-old? You want to impress the girls or your friends or anybody? Yeah, uh, that would have been kind of cool. So we're not really sure. You know, we, really have any, we don't really have any stories of Jesus' young life. You know, that one story when he was 12 years old in the temple, certainly then in the temple he understood his purpose, his mission was to be about his father's business. But the power that he had, you know, he was from the very beginning, he was all God and all man. But I don't know about the demonstration or the expression of his divinity when he was a little boy. But maybe, you know, maybe when he, uh, when he hiccuped, it sounded like angel singing. And when he, uh, you know, his diaper might have smelled like roses or something. Hey, who knows? I mean, if you're God, what's that smell like? I never thought of that myself until just then. But, um, so we don't really know. But we do know and believe that he was all God and all man. Dan Spader said this. He said, Jesus was never less than God and never more than man. He was never less than God and never more than man. And his divinity throughout his life, there were glimpses of it. <clears throat> now, obviously, he didn't live like a God in his life uh, to, the, uh, to the effect that people were like, ooh, wow, look, he's floating, or he's doing this or that. He lived an ordinary life, but he was no ordinary man. He lived just like you and I do, maybe worse he said, I don't even have a pillow to lay my head on. But there were times throughout his ministry where the disciples, those closest to him, were able to see, ooh, there's something different about him. For instance, in Matthew chapter 8, uh, you know, there's a story about the, they were out on the sea. And uh, it, it, this, is, this is the ironic thing about the story. Jesus was sleeping. He was sleeping like a man might sleep. You know, maybe he was taking his nap or something, getting a little rest from the crowds while they were on this boat crossing over. And he was asleep, and the storm came up, and the winds, and the disciples were up top doing their best to bail out the water and keep the ship afloat. And they said, wake him up. Something's, we're going we're gonna to die here. And so he got up, and he, this was the time when he looked at his disciples and says, guys, really? Come on, if you're going to wake me up, wake me up for something. You know, a Hurricane Katrina or something, not this little storm. And uh, he just said, ah, peace, be still. And everything died down. And the, the Bible says the men were amazed and asked, wow, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So that was a little glimpse of, hey, this is not, he's not like us. 
He's different. He's got something else. What kind of man is this? And in Matthew 14, one of the most popular stories of Jesus is when he was walking on the water. Remember that? He's walking on the water, and they saw him. They thought it was a ghost. Peter, he gets out of the boat. You know, we could, we could, stay, we could land right there, you know, get out of the boat, get out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat, and the others sat in the boat, like most of us. Peter got out of the boat. He walked. <clears throat> he began to take his eyes off Jesus. He began to sink. Jesus saved him. And the Bible says, and uh, when he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, there are only two places in the Gospels where the disciples worship Jesus. Only two places. So you know they didn't have this full glimpse or full understanding that he was God. But there were two places where they worshipped him. And so clearly here, they understood that he was not just a man. He was no ordinary man. He was something else. And so they worshipped him. The other place, by the way, is in Matthew 28, where he was ascending, and he gave them the Great Commission. They worshipped him. So he was, he was all God. Colossians Chapter 2, Paul the Apostle wrote, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in a body. Everything of God was in this body. Cram it all into this body. That's God. You didn't, wouldn't think a body could hold God, but it did. Now, I've, I've talked to a lot of Muslims, and this is one reason Muslims don't believe that a God would uh, lower himself and dirty himself into human flesh and to human dirt and suffering and all this stuff. So they don't believe that Jesus was ever God because God wouldn't do that. He would, just wouldn't subject himself to that kind of a low existence. But uh, we believe that he was God. And that's part of a bedrock foundational belief in the Christian church. As Christians, we believe that he was, God. He was a man, but he was also God. So he was, he was man. The Bible says he was human. The Bible says he was hungry. He got hungry. Uh, you know, he was tempted by the devil to eat, and surely he was hungry, but he didn't do it. He was thirsty. Remember on the cross, he got thirsty, he got had something to drink. And there's a lot of stuff in the Gospels that we don't know. You know, someone said that if you were to take all the stories of the four Gospels, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a whole lot alike, basically repeating most of the same stories, and John's a little different. But if you took all of those of his three-year ministry, all you would have is the equivalent of about 30 days, <clears throat> 30 days. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, it, we know that we, there's a lot of days we don't have recorded in the Gospels. The, the writer or, or, or Apostle John, remember what he said at the end of his Gospel? He said, if everything that was written about this man that could have been written, he said the whole world wouldn't have enough room to hold the books. So there's a lot more we know about, uh, we don't know about his humanity than, than we know. We know he was tired. He was sleeping. I just told you about Matthew 8 where he slept, he, so he must have been tired. Uh, and, and he got away a lot of times. He'd get away from the crowds to rest. He cried. John 11, he cried when he lost his friend. I mean, he was all God. He knew he could raise him from the dead, but his humanity cried. He wept when he saw uh, Mary and Martha crying. He sweat. He sweat. That's a very human thing, to sweat. Sweat like big drops, like drops of blood. He prayed what God needs to pray. He was all man. He prayed. He kind of teaches us to pray. He also bled. He bled. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. I think it was Max Licata that said, let him in to the muck and the mire of your world, because only if we let him in with his humanity can he pull us out of ours. So this Jesus that we're pointing to in this story and in our life and the one we've got to get to know in our life, he was all God and all man. And that's kind of hard for us to believe and swallow, but that's what we believe. And a lot of it we have to believe on faith. And, uh, you know, you can, you can be an atheist, but that's faith too. You're taking a chance that there's no God. You can believe in evolution, but it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. So we're all on faith, you know, and I would tell you what, I would rather, I would rather uh, take my chances believing that there's a God who had a son, Jesus Christ, who's in a league of his own, who lived, who was born of a virgin, who, uh, who grew up uh, a carpenter's son, 
who uh, was of lowly means, who didn't, never owned a home. He never owned a horse. Uh, he was loaned a donkey. He was loaned a stall in which to lay himself, you know, when he was a baby. He, uh, he didn't have a suit of clothes. He, uh, you know, he was, he was, poverty was, you know, just the rule of life for him. And uh, he, di- he lived and died and rose again. I'd rather put my chances there than in the belief that there's no God or that Jesus was just a man, whoever he was. So I want to tell you two things about him this morning. First of all, not only was he no ordinary man, he was no ordinary teacher. When he taught, people listened. Now I have to tell you, it is no easy job standing up week after week and teaching God's Word. Because in the 21st century, we are so desensitized to things. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's no easy thing to, to keep your attention. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about preaching, and I said, you know, preaching is a, we, we, you know, we try to stay to about 30 minutes, and, and uh, just like p- people are accustomed to watching a sitcom today, it's about 30 minutes long. And this guy told me, he said, yeah, but in a sitcom, even about the, you know, 15-minute uh, mark or 12-minute mark, guess what? What are there? Commercials to kind of give you an opportunity to take a break. I thought about how to work a commercial into my message. Maybe one of the children's ministers or children's ministry team would run out here and say, hey, we've got this going on in children's ministry. It's cool. You ought to get involved in it. Uh, and then run off the stage. And then we'll get back into the sermon. I don't know if that would work or not. But it's no easy task uh, to, to keep, uh, to get, to, to keep, to hold your attention. Because, uh, you know, we, get, we become desensitized. Same old preacher, same old stage, same old, same old. And it's tough. And so I understand. If you, if you need to take a nap during the message, that's fine. If I can't keep your attention, then take a nap. You know, uh, hopefully you can listen to it later online. But Jesus had this way about him. And when he spoke, people were like, whoa. That's not like what we've been hearing. And that's what they kept saying. It's not like the guys we've been listening to. These these rabbis, these legalistic Pharisaical Pharisees, that's why they were Pharisaical, they, these rabbis, they, they, were the, they were just laying this heavy burden on people. I mean, it was like, okay, number one, you've got to do this. Number two, you've got to do this. Number three, you've got to do this. And if you don't do this, you've got to do this to make up for that. And, and oh, it was every day. So they left church, synagogue every day, and they were beat up, and they were just tired, and they were like, oh, gosh, how are we going to do all that this week? And he's mad at us again. And, uh, you know, why is he always mad at us? Because we're always sinners. Oh, gosh, we're just utterly lost. I hate going to church, but I know I got to go. But I hate it, but I know I got to. Let's go and get through it. Maybe we can play on our iPad while he's preaching, you know, and do something. At least we do have Internet, right? So you can surf the Internet while you're here. Some of you are doing that now, aren't you? You're like, whoa, what, did he see me? I'm not doing that. I know what you're doing. Mark chapter 1, the Bible says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now, Jesus' biggest body of teaching is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And if you did your reading this week in in chapter 24, that's what you read. You read a lot of the the Sermon on the Mount. And this is one of the most uh, uh, all-encompassing diatribes or, or talks or messages uh, of Jesus anywhere. I mean, it's the, it's the epitome of his teaching. It is, it is both uh, sensible and radical at the same time. It is, it is upside down and it is revolutionary. It is, it is nice and it's vicious at the same time in how it uh, demolishes hypocrisy. And the Sermon on the Mount is popular teaching. I mean, really, who would think that the poor are the blessed or the meek will be the blessed? Who would think that those who kind of, you know, shrink back and take a second seat are the blessed? But that's what he said. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor. And that's this. It was kind of radical. People were like, well, we've never heard this before. We think the blessed are the rich and the blessed are the, the uh, uh, you know, those who are uh, uh, strong and those who are uh, offensive or, you know, at least they're on the offense. They're out there. They're type A people. They're the blessed people. They get what they deserve. They take it by force. Jesus said, no, it's just the opposite. The other, the other people are blessed. And, and so that's why at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, people said, 
or Matthew said, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Oh, the Sermon on the Mount is incredible. You know, he just elevated things. You've heard it said that if you, uh, if you kill your brother, that's wrong. Thou shalt not kill. I tell you, if you hate your brother, that's wrong. You've heard it said that if you, if you commit adultery, that's wrong. But I tell you, if you lust, that's wrong. You've heard it said that, uh, uh, you know, that you, you, can't, uh, uh, you know, you can't do this. But I'm telling you, it's way back here. You can't do this. But Jesus, it wasn't like he was preaching legalistically. He was saying, look, it's a whole new standard. And the people were amazed. He taught in parables. Parables, you know, we did a series last summer, and often in Sunday school we learned that a parable is what? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, Jesus was telling stories. He wasn't just, you know, preaching on down the line. He was saying, hey, let me tell you a story. There was a guy, there was this farmer one time, and he went outside, and he began to sow seed. And he sowed seed in like four, four or five different places. And I want to tell you about the seed. This seed fell here, and it didn't grow, and this seed fell here. And the people were like, yeah, man, I can relate to that. I just sowed seed yesterday. I just plowed up my back 40 yesterday, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And Jesus, at the end of that story, he would go, boom. And you'd feel like your throat was cut, you know, and you didn't even realize it because he would get to the point of things, the heart of things in this parable. And so it was like, whoa, I was, I was drawn into the story. But now at the end of it, it's like, whoa, he's talking about me. It's incredible how he does that. You've heard speakers like that. You've been places where there was a speaker so captivating and engaging. He just drew you in. Before you know it, he was slitting your throat. And you're like, oh, gosh, he got me there. I, I need to do something. He was talking to me the whole time. Parables, uh, you know, they really exemplify the rabbi's view of the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament times, <clears throat> by that time, the 400 years of silence, there had all these, these groups have grown up, like the Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and Zealots and all these people that we have a little bit of reference to in the New Testament. We don't have in the Old Testament, but in that 400 years, we have them. And so these people, the Jewish people, because they didn't have any prophets, you know, since Malachi, they began to follow these rabbis. And they would choose the rabbi they agreed with. That's what we do, isn't it? I like listening to him because I agree with him. We don't like to listen to people we don't agree with. Did you, ever, did you ever realize that? It's hard to listen to somebody you don't agree with. I mean, there are some news stations I just turn to and I throw up and then I change the channel. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, they would say, hey, I'm going to follow him. And so a rabbi, a teacher, would become known and he would gather a following. And those would be called his disciples. And there were lots of rabbis in New Testament times, and they had lots of followers. Well, Jesus was a rabbi. He would, he would teach. He was no ordinary teacher. And so, uh, unlike, unlike most rabbis who let the, the students choose them, that's what they would do. The, the student would say, I'm following you. Okay, come on. Jesus reversed that, and he chose the students. Remember? He went and he, he chose. He called Peter. Andrew, all those disciples. And he says, I want you to come, follow me. And so this became known as a yoke. And so the, the student would take the yoke of the rabbi. Now, this is not a yoke like oxen, but it's sort of like that in a figurative sense. The, ra the, the student would, would take on his shoulders, if you will, the teaching of the rabbi. That's what I agree with. This is where I want to go. That you're the one I want to follow. And so this, the yoke of the rabbi became the, became the thing. We're taking his yoke. We're going to live like he lives. We're going to follow him. If he sleeps on the dirt, we're sleeping on the dirt. If he eats the worm, we're going to eat the worm. You know, whatever he does, he's our teacher. <clears throat> if he says this, we're going to believe that. And we're going to even do other things once he's gone. So this yoke was a, uh, was a big deal. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And he's contrasting himself with the Pharisees and the teachers. Their yoke was heavy. It was heavy. It was going out of church, being beat up, and knowing I cannot do this. I can't do it. Jesus said, look, I want you to come and Get some rest, some refreshment for your soul. 
you know, when I was a young preacher, I, uh, when I was growing up in church, the method of a lot of the preachers that I heard was uh, the, uh, you know, the, the panting dog method. You heard the panting dog, <gasps> you know, uh, and they kind of bark, you know, they get the barking. And it wasn't that bad, but, you know, I asked my mom when I was a kid one time, I, I, li- I was listening to the preacher about 15 minutes, and I asked her, I said, what's he so mad about? It was every week he was so mad. And, uh, you know, you have to decide if you're going to be a preacher, how, what's your style? What's going to be your style? Are you going to yell at people all the time? I want to tell you, people get yelled at enough out there in the, in the world. Or are you going to, are you going to talk to them? You can converse with them and uh, appeal to, to their hearts. And so that's what Jesus said. He said, look, I, my yoke's easy. Now, don't be fooled. Following Christ is not easy. What he's talking about here is, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put burdens on you. I'm going to give you freedom. It's a whole new deal. And, and the, so these, these, uh, these guys would follow him. They're like, whoa, man, he, he laughs. He laughs. My, these other teachers, they don't laugh. They're all serious all the time. And uh, so there was this writing in the Mishnah that said, may you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. In other words, may you follow him so closely, may you be on him so closely that the, his dust is on you. And you, 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 we know you're following him because his dust is on you. Mark chapter 1, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching with, with authority? In Luke chapter 4, the Bible says he went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught. And the Bible says they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. This word amazed is used 30 times in the Gospels. 27 of the 30 is used in the context of people responding to Jesus. 27 of the 30 times, the word amazed is that when people were looking at Jesus or listening to Jesus, they were amazed, they were amazed. It was like, man, where did this guy come from? This is fresh, this is new, this is nothing we've ever heard of. What is, he's saying stuff that, we, I mean, we know this is true, but he's saying it in a way that is, it's just revolutionary. He used humor. Did you know Jesus used humor when he taught? Yeah, he used humor. I think people were, it was, it was gut-wrenching humor. I think people were just rolling, laughing. And you might think, well, well, I don't remember any jokes Jesus told in the Gospels. Well, again, we're 21st century sitcom desensitized uh, Christians today. It's hard to make, uh, you know, uh, make us laugh and things like that. <clears throat> Jesus, remember the story in the, in the Bible when he says, hey, you Pharisees, this is Matthew 23, he says, uh, why do you try to take a speck out of your, uh, your neighbor's eye, and you got a two-by-four plank in yours. In the first century, that would have been funny. They would have rolled laughing because you can see the image. Remember, you've, you've been bombarded all your life with images, TV, advertisements, magazines, coloring books, all that stuff. You've been bombarded. In the first century, they didn't have this stuff. So when he painted this image with words, they... They were like, yeah, that is so funny. Did you hear about the one with the two before? Let me tell you that one. And they remembered that. Or he would say, hey, you, you Pharisees, hey, you go to drink something, and uh, you wash the cup. You wash the outside of the cup, and you leave the inside dirty. And they're like, oh, how silly, how stupid. And they just laughed. He used, he used hyperbole, which in uh, grammatical or English terms, that means a great exaggeration. So the greater the exaggeration, the funnier the the story. So Jesus used humor and kept people's attention. And, uh, you know, he used poetry. He taught from the Old Testament. He was a teacher like nobody else, and he grabbed their attention. And so uh, this is something we see about him, that he's different. Not only was he no ordinary teacher, he was no ordinary king. Yeah. Now, Matthew chapter 2, you might remember that when the wise men showed up, they, they asked Herod, they said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Because we've come to worship him. That he was called king from the very day of his birth, even before. Now you book in that and come over to the end of his life. In, in John chapter 19, when they hung him on the cross, the Bible says that Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Now the, the Jews said, don't put that he was king of the Jews. Put that he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate said, look, deal with it. That, what I wrote, I wrote. Get out of here. And so the beginning of his life, the end of his life, he was acknowledged as a king. He was a king. 
Now, I know you look at his life and say, well, gosh, what can we compare him to? He's not like King uh, William or King Henry and, or all the kings throughout history who had these people helping put on their pants. I mean, he's, what kind of king is he? And, uh, and you know, the, uh, the Jewish people at the time, I'm sure, were looking for a king, a Messiah, who would ride in on a horse with soldiers and swords, and they're going to wipe out the Romans and restore Israel to its, its place, like in the days of David and, the, and Solomon, where the, the nation of Israel was the great, and they were living in their territory that God had given them. But it was not a physical kingdom. It's, a, first of all, a spiritual kingdom. It's spiritual. And for, for years of his ministry, I don't think his disciples ever understood this. He never got it. They thought, it was, got it. when's it coming? When's the kingdom coming? And listen, the kingdom has come. It's, it's in your heart. It's a spiritual thing. Now, there'll be a day when it's physical again, but it's spiritual. And it's hard for people to understand that. In John 18, he said, look, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my servants would fight. But now my kingdom is from another place. And so throughout his teaching, he talked about the kingdom, what it was like. And it was, it was never really a physical thing. It was spiritual. Matthew 13 has a lot of these. He said the kingdom is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed? What is a little tiny seed? What's that? That's nothing. Yeah, but let me tell you about the mustard seed. It's a spiritual thing. It starts small, and it begins to grow in you. And before you know it, you've got to do something about it. Kind of like the moon that uh, uh, the Despicable Me guy stole. Remember that? We watched it on TV last night. He shrunk it down, but what happened? Boom, it got back to big. That's what God's word in your heart will do. Uh, he said that it's like yeast. Yeast? That's not a physical. I mean, it's physical. It's a powder. What is that? Well, look at what yeast does to the bread. It changes it. It transforms it. It does something. And the kingdom is like that. When you get a hold of it, when you understand it, your life is never the same. It begins to change. It's like a hidden treasure in a field. What do you mean, a hidden treasure? Yeah, the kingdom is like that because when you find it, you realize, hey, this is valuable. This is precious. I'm going to sell out everything. And, I'm, and whatever it takes, I'm going I'm to go after this. That's what the kingdom is like. It's like a merchant, he said, looking for fine pearls. In other words, the kingdom is like this. It's like Hey, when you realize it's there, you're not going to stop pursuing it. You're going to keep going after it. You've got to have it. This is, this is your life. This is who you want to become. This is who you want to follow. This is how you want to live. That's what the kingdom's like. It's like a net. It's like a net. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grab up a lot of people, and some aren't going to stay in, and some are going to stay in. And so that's, that's what the kingdom is like. It is a spiritual kingdom. But it's also universal. You see, the Jewish people got to the point to where, hey, they hated everybody, you know, except us Jews. And, you know, we've been beat up enough the last uh, 500 years by these Gentiles. It's a Jewish thing. We want a Jewish leader. We want a Jewish king. And we want to take back our land. But Jesus said, look, it's, this is not just for you. Remember the promise to Abraham? All nations will be blessed. And he said, I say, many will come from the east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people here at the table. And uh, you guess what else? In this kingdom, it's not just for the pretty. It's not just for the perfect. It's for the, it's for the outsiders. Not just the insiders. You know, our culture, whether we want to admit it or not, in some backhanded way or some subtle way, even today, in the 21st century, as advanced as we are, our culture, I'm not saying all of us or the church or all of you, our culture has a way of saying to people, you're not perfect, you're different, you're on the edge. But Jesus said, hey, when you have a party, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and you'll be blessed. And although they can't repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Uh, you know, and so, and so folks who are born with disabilities or, or some kind of problem, I love, I just love our Jesus prom. Don't you guys? How many of you have ever worked with the Jesus prom here? <clears throat> you've done something with it. I want to tell you, if you've never done that, you should do that. It is a blessing. It's such a blessing. Some of you have children, uh, special needs children, and, and, uh, and you know, our society really doesn't do a whole lot for them. And we're, we're getting better 
But I just, you know, just did my heart good when we started doing that, Jesus Prom. And this coming uh, Saturday a week from this Saturday uh, in our Taze Valley campus through there, they're having a Halloween uh, festival with partnering with the Whitney Foundation for Special Needs. They had a, a theater uh, movie event not too long ago. But listen, it's, it's all those on the outside to whom our society says, hey, you're different, you're not going to make it, you're just out here on the fringe, that Jesus said, hey, I'm not in the kingdom. They've got a front row. They're in the front row. they got the best seats in the house. And that's who I want you to reach. That's who I want you to go after. Those that our culture says, you need to sit over here on the edge. You go after those, the outsiders. Because when he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's what he meant and everybody in it. So it's universal, it's spiritual. But not only is it spiritual and universal, it's also unusual. It's an unusual kingdom. I mean, we've already mentioned some of it, but really when you think about it, people had to come to grips with the fact that this is not going to be an ordinary kingdom. It's very unusual. I mean, when you think about it, in our kingdom we would think, okay, the strongest, they're going to be the best, the most athletic, the, the best looking. You know, the superlatives we get in our high school, you know, they're the ones that are really going to make it. I mean, how many of you were voted most likely to succeed in your high school? Anybody? Do we have any most likely to succeed? So what I got here is all uh, people who were just not, not expected to succeed. Is that who's coming to church here? Is that what you're saying? Did anybody have best looking uh, or cutest couple? Okay, I get it. I know what you're doing now. You're just, you're, you don't want to boast. You know, you don't want to, yeah, I got all those, I got all those. I was at a very small school, so I racked up about half of ours. <clears throat> But I intimidated them into it, you know. I told you, you better vote for me on that. I don't even remember. But, you know, that's what we say in our culture. But in this kingdom, he said the first will be last. The last will be first. He said the greatest will be your servant. He says if you want to find your life, you got to lose it. In the kingdom, there are things that matter that don't matter to in our culture. For instance, in the kingdom, one lost sheep matters over 99 who are saved now folks listen to me uh this is revolutionary for the church and i wish i had thought of this last service but i didn't because both services need to hear this jesus says in the kingdom you need to do more to reach the lost than you do to make the saved happy that's a, that's a revolutionary step. I, I feel like in a lot of churches, we got it the opposite. We want to keep everybody happy and forget the lost. If they happen to wander in, so be it, but let's just keep everybody happy. This is revolutionary. It's right there in Luke 15. This matters. It matters. It matters so much that we need to do like the woman who lost her coin. We need to move the furniture. We need to rearrange we need to get down on our hands and knees, and we need to find the lost. Isn't that revolutionary? And when the church gets this right, that church will start being the church God called us to be. One lost child, one prodigal child matters. That matters more than everybody else who's not lost. Well, the son that stayed said, hey, Dad, well, I've been here the whole time. You didn't kill a fatted cat for me. We've been eating bologna the whole time. What's going on? You didn't do anything for me. Dad said, look, you've been with me the whole time, and I love you, and I'm proud of you, but your brother was lost. I mean, do you know what that means to be lost? But now he's found. What a celebration in the kingdom. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents that's when the hallelujah chorus is sung in heaven. This matters more. A clean heart matters more than going through the motions with our life. Offering forgiveness matters more than having justice. Yeah, but he needs to pay for that. They need to answer for this. No, we need to offer forgiveness. That's what we need to do. That matters more than you getting righted or justice in your life. That's hard, isn't it? Because when somebody offends us, and we want, we want justice, we want to get back at them, we just want to say something or do something, 
not in the kingdom. In the kingdom, what matters more than getting justice is offering forgiveness. It's hard to offer forgiveness to someone who hurt you. I mean, they might have really hurt you. You might have lost life and limb. It might have been your son or daughter killed by a drunk driver or somebody doing something that changes your son or daughter or life forever. And you're thinking, I can never do that. That matters in the kingdom. I, you know, I wish I could tell you it was easy. I can't. But that's what's in the kingdom. That's what matters. Loving enemies is more important than, than uh, fighting them. Loving your enemy, he said. This matters more. Obedience over talk. You can talk all you want to, but what are you going to do about it? Truth over popularity. You can decide to be popular or you can decide to stand with the truth. That matters in the kingdom. Love over power. You know, when the Bible says when Jesus stood before Pilate, he did not open his mouth to defend himself. You know why? I mean, had it been you or I, we would have said, look, I'm not guilty. You can't kill me. I am innocent. I'm innocent. The Bible says like a lamb led before the slaughter, he did not open his mouth. Chuck Colson put it this way. He said, there have been hundreds of presidents and kings, and in times of war they have all done the same thing. They have asked their subjects to go out and lay down their lives for them. But only one king went out and laid down his life for his subjects. It's an unusual kingdom. He was no ordinary king. One of my favorite stories is in John 4. Jesus goes through Samaria, and he sits down at this well. He's thirsty. And he, this woman was there, and he says, hey, can I have a drink? And it shocked her because men don't speak to women. Plus, she can see that he's a Jew. She knows that he knows that she's a Samaritan, which was kind of a, a Syrian blood in her. She had been mixed. Her bloodline had been mixed. So the Jews looked down on these people. That's why they would walk around it instead of going through it. He went right through it, sat down at the well, and he said, can you give me something to drink? She said, you're asking me, a woman? You a Jew asking me for something to drink? He said, yeah, if you knew who was asking you, you would ask me for a drink of living water. And they got into this conversation, and he said, hey, go get your husband. And she's, she, she begins to hear the creak of a tiny door in her heart begin to open that had not been opened, that had been sealed shut with the cold, icy emotion or maybe emotionless of her heart. And she thought, how did he know? Why is he asking me this? And so her immediate reaction was, I've got to lie to him. And she said, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you don't. He said, in fact, you've had five husbands. And maybe I want to believe there that her husband had died or something. And, but uh, I think the insinuation there is that she had been kind of hopping around a little bit. And Jesus didn't condemn her. Just like in John chapter 8, when the woman was caught in adultery, he didn't condemn her. And so this woman, the door swung open wide, and she let Jesus in, and they began to talk, and who knows what all they said there. But I want to tell you, whatever was said there, she felt the love of God, the love of Christ in her, and she got up, and the Bible says she went back to her town, <clears throat> And she spoke to her people, and the Bible says many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And here's what she said. She said, come and meet a man. This is in another version. Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. I don't know how, but he knows everything about me. I want you to meet him. I want you to know him. So the Samaritans, they came to him. They said, stay with us. And a lot of people became believers and they said, we don't believe just because of what you said now. We know for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Billy Graham put it this way. He said, if Jesus is who he said he is and who the New Testament writers say he is, then life's most important business seems like it would be getting to know him. Do you know him? Do you know him? And so I think we, what we have to do is we have to kind of, we have to, we have to fight through our culture, and we have to fight through what we've always believed and always known, and we have to get to the real Jesus, and we have to discover, hey, this is what he wants from me, and it's not a lot of heavy stuff. He doesn't expect a whole lot of 
heavy stuff. In fact, he told Mary and Martha, he said, uh, uh, only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. Really, only one. And for some of you this morning, that one is to trust him with your life. Stand up with me. Let's pray. God, thank you today for your love and your grace through Jesus Christ. I pray that right now, as uh, some are contemplating a decision for you, that, that uh, they would let you in, that the, the cold part of their hearts would warm up to your, to your free gift of forgiveness and salvation. I pray, God, that you would bless us today with an understanding, not only of who you are, but the life you have for us and what kind of church we ought to be. I pray that, God, today in the name of your Son. Amen. Last service, a man came forward and said, hey, the Holy Spirit's been kicking me in the butt for the last several months. He said, and today I couldn't take it anymore. He said, I'm a Christian, and uh, I, I want to put roots down in this church. I just feel like I need to be accountable, and I want to I say this is, this is who I am now. And so Steve Parsons, our fire chief, came forward and said, hey, I want to put roots down. What a great encouragement to a lot of us. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're already a Christian, but you kind of, you know, when, when you, before you commit to a church, you're kind of like, you know, that's them, and this is me. And if, if they do it right, that's fine. I'm not part of that. But a lot of us need to take that step and commit and say, you know what, this is us. We're responsible now for reaching those people. It's us now. It's not them and me. It's us. Maybe that's your decision today. Maybe you've trusted him. You've been baptized. Maybe today it's say, hey, I want to put roots down. I want, to, I want you to know you can count on me because it's us. Whatever decision you have today. I had a, listen, I had, a, I had a lady come to me after the first service in tears. And she said, look, she said, I've been talking to my mother. <clears throat> she said, I thought I had been baptized as a kid. And I asked my mom a while back, and she said, yeah. And then she said, Last week after Ryan's sermon, I talked to her again. She said, no, you've never been baptized. And she said, Mom, why not? She said, because you were afraid. And she never did it. And she began to cry. And she said, Mom, I've been living a lie. I, I've, I've told people that I've made that commitment. I've, I've followed that, that step of obedience. And, and I've not done that. And it meant so much to her that she was weeping. And, uh, and so we're going to take care of that. Maybe that's you. I don't know. But I want to tell you. Jesus is knocking at the door. Uh, you open it, all right, as we sing.